Okay, welcome everyone to this last Design++ seminar series of this spring. I would also like to welcome Yi Zhang Huang, who is here uh, from the Computational Robotics Lab with uh, Professor Stelian Koros from ETH Zurich. And he will present our last uh, talk of this seminar series. But first, short introduction from our side. Um, yeah. We have had four nice talks now, uh, with yours as the last one. And um, we will always upload these onto YouTube um, after they have been completed. So if you have missed one of them and you were interested in watching them, you can go online and you will find them here on YouTube. Uh, this is our team who has organized it. Today we are all here. It's myself, uh, Danielle, Michael and Daniela who have put together this series and we're very happy that you've all come here today uh, to listen to this. So as I already mentioned, uh, today we have Yi Zhang Huang and he is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Computer Science. He holds a PhD in Building Technology program from MIT. And before that, he studied applied mathematics in China. And his research is centered on computational design in construction, uh, where he especially is interested in modeling and automated planning of the construction process and the development of scalable reactive planning methods to coordinate humans, robots, and resources for sustainable design. And this sustainable design is also at the core of the Design++ Plus Plus initiative, which is why we are here. And so your talk will be going into um, how we can tackle this problem with uh, more connected construction because there already exist methods such as BIM for development. Um, however, still a lot of manual effort is needed um, to check such methods. Um, for example, to assign tasks, to compose schedules, or also to balance resources. And you are now going to propose three main points, how to enhance um, design built flexibility, with enabling robotic uh, assembly, reducing wasted programming efforts, and allowing for a design that's responsive to upcycled material inventory. So thank you very much for being here, and this stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here today to share my work with the Design++ community and, share, and hear from you and uh, to talk about this idea that I'd like to promote to use computation to bring architecture design and construction closer together. So I have a bit of an unusual path to architecture. I was trained in applied math back in my college days and I got excited to use of those powerful but abstract mathematical tools to improve our built environment. And then I, I moved to the US and did my PhD at MIT in the building technology program here, there. And I learned how architectural design should and can be guided by structural performance principles. And for my research there, I focused on the performance of construction, which means we want to, we want to make robot fabrication more flexible to design inputs. And now I'm a postdoc at the Computational Robotics Lab at ETH, where I focus on building a collaborative autonomy to enhance uh, construction efficiency. And in general, I identify myself as a half computer scientist, half architecture engineer. And in general, I've been working on algorithms to generative design algorithm to, to, to design structurally efficient forms, computational design of reused materials, and, innov and innovating new robotic fabrication process, and also automated planning, which I will talk in more details today, to, to program robots and guide humans to build forms more effectively. And a common theme that caught across all of these projects is that I believe by creatively using computation, we can reduce a lot of wasted manual efforts in design and planning of those things. And by doing so, we are creating a more connected and streamlined process between construction and design. 
and I believe this is very important because of the cur current climate crisis. And we all know that the built environment is responsible for about 40% of the global carbon emission each year. And our, our, our growing urban population is demanding more infrastructure and housing to be built more faster, but with less material and consumed energy. So one thing that we, can, we should improve is this linear and unidirectional workflow connecting design and construction. And in the current paradigm, uh, the architect would finish the drawing and then the drawing is kind of thrown over a wall to the contractor whose sole role is to decide you know, how to build it. But the planning and evaluation of this whether this design can really be built is solely decided by the contractor behind closed doors. And the pro computer programs like BIM 4D and I think 4D, the additional dimension is time, uh, makes the important first step to help contractor to have a more granular control on the construction process and can generate animations like this one to help all the stakeholders to have a better understanding and understand what's going on in the construction plan. But generating this plan still takes a lot of manual efforts and currently it still involves a few human planners to really manually assign tasks, compo compose schedules, and then and a lot of mouse clicks and brain powers. So it is tedious, but also very challenging for humans to, to really organize this humongous amount of material and resources and space and time to come up with a good construction plan. And also such a manual process also breaks this connection between design and construction, because whenever the, the, the high level, the, the, you know, the upstream design get changed a little bit, Every, all of those plans need to be redone, re redone. And this duplicated planning works might take days and weeks in breaking the design feedback process. So in my research, I aim to use automated planning and automation to really improve and fix this broken pipeline. And uh, I want to, I aim to promote, uh, to, to kind of promote the role of the construction planner from their status today to someone who can write algorithms that, that are scalable and cater to complicated processes and can, can build things in a more efficient way, so we're building ways that are not possible before. And automated planning is a long established field that has been the powerhouse between, behind uh, uh, many aspects of our modern daily life. For example, the, the optimization of train schedules in Switzerland, we are, we're all in enjoying the benefit of it and the logistics and supply chain and also it has played an important role of the AI forefront of playing chess. But I believe the, the, the main reason that why these techniques are not widely applied into construction planning is that this field is a very technical field with a lot of scattered algorithms and tools that are designed either for overly generalized, very general problems or for some really specific problems. And it takes knowledge in both construction and automated planning to really bring those two fields together by composing existing tools and inventing new frameworks to stitch things together. So, so from a research perspective, obviously we cannot just go to a job site and try to test our new construction plan with a human worker. So my re current research focuses on automated planning for robot builders in a construction environment, which can be precisely simulated and replayed and tested. So throughout this talk, I will show you three works demonstrating, trying to demonstrate the power of those automated planning and show the benefits it brings to design and construction. So I will start by designing an intelligent search algorithm that can help us to make robotic assembly to be more flexible to arbitrary design input. And then I will try to build upon this to expand the success to empower the program and, 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 and the modeling of other new robot processes. And I will end with a resource planning method that help us to design more swiftly and responsively to upcycle material resources. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So in the first project, our goal is to really investigate how to automatically program robots to, 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 to assemble arbitrary bar structures. And what we're trying to achieve here is generating this equivalent of a slicing algorithm that we will use for FDM printing to enable robots to assemble bars more in a more flexible way, those non-standard shapes. But compared to programming of a gantry machine that moves only in X, Y, and Z, programming a uh, high degree of freedom robot manipulators is much more complicated because we have to carefully curating the assembly sequence and for each element where the robot will grasp it, 
as well as fully specify the robust joints values throughout the entire uh, construction process. And all of these things add up together into an enormous search space that we have to operate in. And a valid assembly plan have to uh, specify two type of constraints, main type of constraints. The first is a structural constraint that prevents us from choosing a bat sequence like this one that builds this cantilevering substructure without any supporting elements below it, which would deform too much under gravity and causing harms through the process. And, and on the other hand, we also need to make sure that the assembly plan satisfy the collision constraint, which ensures that the robot does not collide into itself, the environment, and the things that it just built. And as the robot builds more and more, the space gets more cluttered. And the assembly sequence has a huge impact on the reachable space of the robot. And these two constraints really make those var variables intertwined together, making searching for assembly plan, a feasible assembly plan, really challenging. So obviously, the traditional way of robot programming that's widely used uh, in the industry, in the, in the manufacturing industry, does not work well here because we don't even have a physical reference object to start with. And on the other hand, the, the field of motion planning, a, a subfield of robotics, is a pretty mature field with a lot of off-the-shelf tools that we can just use. But it only solves part of the problem. A motion planning algorithm in its general form basically searching the robot joint space to bring it from one configuration to the other without colliding into the obstacles in the world. But as, as I just described, this is only one variable in our assembly planning problems. And, in, and as a result, designers need to really still need to really guess and assign the combination of the sequence and the grasp and use those motion planners in a trial and narrow fashion until they can, they can they can, they can hit the buttons in enough times to find a feasible assembly plan. And this is really non-intuitive and time consuming. And our goal of this project is really to automate this trial and error process with an algorithm that, that can do so in a more systematic and effective way. So the best way to formulate this planning problem is using the, for, using the framework of a state space search. A state basically keeps track of the progression of the construction that includes both a partially built structure and the robot trajectories of the current step. And the automated search process would basically go from the empty state where nothing is built by adding one element at a time. And every single time it advanced to a new state, it would first call a structural analysis to predict the deformation. And then it also tried to try to trying to find trying to check if there exists a collision-free trajectory for the robot to bring the element over and, uh, and insert the bar. And it will keep doing so until it, find it reaches the goal, the fully assembled state. To check the collision constraint, four sampling processes needs to be coupled together. So we first sample the grasp and an approaching trajectory on the bar itself, and then we use a, a constrained motion planner like the, 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 the random, randomized gradient descent to find the robot trajectory to follow this scraper path to insert the bar. And then we use a, use a free motion planner like the RRT star to connect the pickup position to this insertion configuration. As for the structural constraint, we need to call the finite element analysis to predict the deformation. And we adopt a linear elasticity model here for the frame structure, which involves at in each single state, first assemble the stiffness matrix for the partial, partial structure, and then solve a linear system to predict the deformation. And the structural checker will say, okay, this state is structurally feasible if the maximum nodal deformation is under a tolerance. And it's important to note that our search here is already trying to like, it's already an improvement from our previously manual trial and error because it would manually backtrack if it reached into a a state that's not feasible. For example, it if, if, if one state is not feasible, it will backtrack and then try another state until it reaches the goal. But there are still challenges preventing this trivial, this, this more standard state space search from working for generic complex structures. We can think about this search as driving in a very thick fog without a map. This means that we can only make local de decisions without a global view. So it's like if you have played with such games like StarCraft, you know, this war of fog is this is the idea. They can only, you know, click locally, everything is black uh, unless you explore it. So, so we need to decide where to go at each crossing based on local information, but there are just too many options to choose from. 
and every single time we advance to a new state, checking the feasibility of the states involves the two computational routines that I just described, the structural check and the, and the, and the reachability check. Both of these involves additional computational overhead that adds up, adds up, adds up quickly. Um, and finally, although the algorithm can backtrack, we want to avoid reaching to too many dead ends because the search will, will, will basically spend a lot of waste efforts into searching into this dead end and backtrack and making this search run forever. So the first observation that we make in our work is, a, is that a standard forward search can easily get stuck because of collision. So this is an example that, uh, that the search will start from the ground and there are just too many seemingly innocent options at the beginning and it keeps making those greedy decisions. And on, only until the very end, it realize, ah, I get stuck here because there's one element that I cannot reach anymore. So the, one of the key algorithmic insights that we have in this work is that we should, we, instead of going forward, we should, we should search backwards. This means that we start from the completed state and start removing elements like we, when we're playing in the Jenga game. So this means by doing backward search, we limit the planner's options at the beginning of the search. It, it basically means the, the, the search cannot easily just try to remove any of those elements in the, in, at the bottom of the, of, of the shape at the very beginning because they are pruned by the collision checker. And this proves to be essential for the search to, to avoid hitting into a lot of dead ends as related to collision. And another important thing, uh, in addition to the search direction, is a heuristic. And we can think of it as a road sign um, when you're hiking in the mountain. It tells you which direction at this crossing is, is more promising for you to get, get you closer to the goal. And an obvious heuristic would be to, to rank all the elements based on their height and always prioritize removing elements as higher up. Well, this works for many shapes. It might, it might fail for a shape like this tower, which I borrowed from my, co my previous colleague, Junyi Lee, here at NCCR. Um, because the, 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 the heuristic bias the search to remove all of the tension ties at the, at, the, at, the, at the top, the partial structure below it would deform too much because these are the key stabilizing elements to, 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 help, to help it uh, staying stiff. And then the search will get stuck in a structurally induced dead end. And, and the, uh, the second algorithmic insight that we have is, to, is this new heuristic that, that's uh, bootstrapped by a feasible, structurally feasible sequence, which means the, the heuristic will, will try to get the search to adhere to the sequence as much as possible while staying, uh, s giving it still have some flexibility to balance with the collision constraints. And all of this added together can finally give us this really fast and scalable planning algorithm, these two recipes, the backward search and the structural heuristic. And in contrast to a naive forward search algorithm that cannot terminate in hours, it can find a complete construction plan for this complicated bar structure in only three minutes. And we can also visualize the structural deformation along the construction step in the, in the plot below here. So each single dot on this plot represents a, a, a FBA simulation of the partially built structure, and we can see the, 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 the deformation is controlled un well under the given tolerance. And another power of this, uh, having this computational routine is that not, not only we can just plan for this one particular shape, now we can plan for all those different types of geometry without changing anything. So just stick those shapes into the, into the planner, click a button, and within six minutes, it will give you a complete plan which can be directly loaded on the robot for assembly. And another advantage of having this planning formulism is that it can be easily extended to other robotic fabrication process that has a similar pattern of action. So here, spatial extrusion here. So we can now extrude all those different kinds of geometry and topology. And here is the topology optimized beam that's, uh, that's designed for efficient load transfer. And here's another example of a climb bottle, which reveals my kind of my addiction to those classic math objects. And finally, um, this planning framework also allows us to experiment with different kind of motion planners. And they really start to make those, you know, available tools from the computer, from the robotics community 
to act like commodity for us to achieve our design outcome. So we can easily just swap in and play with them and to see which one is, works better for us. And also it means not only we gain flexibility in achieving uh, complex geometry, we also have flex means flexibility to work with different types of machines and set up. So it doesn't matter what robot brand you, you, you happen to be working with and how many, how many joints they have and what kind of customized design and factor you're using. This planning framework is generic enough to allow plug and play of different type of robot models. And here's the animation of using our approach on the ABB robot on a linear track to extrude a scaled up version of our topology optimized beam that's to span across uh, three meters. So in summary, in this work, we designed an integrated search algorithm that can search for the robot motion and the assembly sequence at the same time. And we've shown its effectiveness to enable robot assembly to be res responsive to different type of design input without changing anything underneath the planning framework. And also we show that we can expand it to robot uh, spatial extrusion without too much problem. And ultimately, our goal is to make this planning framework to be fast enough so that it can be used as a, desi as a design input into the, pro into the design process. Right now, although the current form unoptimized uh, implementation takes minutes to uh, come up with a plan, it's, we, we, are, we are already using it as a design check. So we design something, we, we, we put it into the, the framework, click, click a button, and it gives us a yes or no answer in, in a similar way that we are working with our 3D printing slicer right now. So by mo automating those uh, planning process, in a way, we're not only enhancing our capability to build previously impossible shapes, but it also help us to gain some insights on constructability itself, which is something that I'm, I'm continuously fascinating with and, and trying to push for more research into. And now that we have a solid planning uh, methods to, to support uh, the, the program of robotic assembly, we now want to expand the success to support other type of robot fabrication process where the robot does not only just pick and place, but also can change tools, cut, drill, and do all the kind of things. And as researchers, I think especially for people in this building, we, are all, we all spend a lot of time thinking about how to cur curating those robot actions and you know, program the robot motions to achieve what we want. But one, unfortunately, one thing, one painful experience that we, all of us share somehow is you know, some of the prototype, early prototype robot program cannot adapt well enough to design change later that we make. So we all spend a lot of time, you know, you, those wasted and duplicated programming efforts start to accumulate up. And this project really is trying to think about how do we, um, how do we allow, how do we cook up a generic computa computational framework that allow designer to focus on their high level design of the process itself, and then use algorithm to streamline the rest of it, the curating of the tasks and the program of the motion. So we take inspiration from computer programming. When you work with a programming language like Python, you, the composition and the execution of the program usually takes three phrases, phases. First, you write code that express the uh, instructions and algorithm that, that has the high level desired behavior of the program. And then the compiler or the interpreter will take over and translate it into a lower level representation that the machine can more effectively operate on. And finally, the processor would dispatch those instructions to basic computing units which are spe specialized for doing operations like adding and multiplying numbers. And in our context, we, we try to, we're trying to make this analogy that you know, the basic computing units here are inverse kinematic solvers and motion planners. And what we are trying to achieve here is to build this compiler that trying to take the high level intention from the designer and then turn it into a lower level representation where the, those computing units can operate on more effectively. So to ground our discussion a little bit, let me introduce you to a case study that many of you are pretty familiar with. This is from Victor Leon, a, uh, a PhD student from Grumazian Corps at ETH Zurich. And in his research, he proposes new process to allow a robot arm to assemble spatial tim stru timber structure with those tight fit integral joints. And while humans usually use this big hammer approach to overcome those high friction force between the, the joints, it's obviously quite hard for the, the current industry robots to do it. If you really push to doing it, I think your robot controller, your warranty, and your lab technician will scream at you at the same time. So in a as a response, 
Victor proposed those remotely controlled clamps that can be mounted on the timber, timber structure first by the robot, and it can generate a large number of pulling force. Then the robot will t bring the timber over and simultaneously push with the, those clamps to overcome the friction force. So with, with this kind of the, the conception in mind, we can start to organize the robot action and, and, and visualize the entire construction process. And the main challenge that we're encountering here is there are just too many robot tasks to be organized and, and, and handled and even more robot motions to be programmed. Even for this seemingly innocent 14 element timber structure, it requires 671 tasks to be, to be curated and then programmed. It's definitely not a good idea for a designer to search, spend such a long time to, you know, just to do these. So in this project, we're trying to introduce this flowchart-based compiler and a motion solver that allows you to, allows designer to express their process uh, intention in this high level but compact format, like a flowchart. I know this is pretty dense, but, but basically the key here is that using those flowchart, we can, we can have this compact representation and then, and then the, it can, it, and then it allows the automatic curation of a lot of, uh, a lot of operations, for example, those conditional uh, statement here that allows the flowchart to curate a var variable number of clamp manipulation based on the, the timber elements uh, feature. And then having this flowchart, the rest of it is kind of, the rest of the workflow is automated. The compiler first takes a flowchart and turns it into a, this long list of robot movements. And the key, really the key here is that it breaks down those high level tasks into the smaller chunks of robot mo movement correspond to the capability of the motion planner. And then, we, and then the, the motion solver will take over and trying to compute the robot trajectory for each one of those little blocks. And the, each one of these little, little blocks here represents different type of robot motions. And the key of the, one of the key ingredients of the solver is that it kind of, instead of linearly solve motions one by one, we smartly group them and then identify the most constrained motion and then propagate outwards. So our results show that this strategy greatly reduced the planning time compared to a naive approach that sequentially solve motions one by one. So now is the time to enjoy the fruits of our compiler solver approach. So here's the timber structure prototype that, that, that includes 40 elements and Ex when expanded to the entire, the ex expand from the flowchart into the entire robot movements, it includes more than 4,400 robot motions. And the, and the planning of those, the entire construction process takes about five hours of computation without any human intervention. And we can see from this video that a lot of those motions really involves robots to operate in this tightly cluttered environment which can be very hard to and unintuitive for motion to, to human to really like program those, those behavior. And our solver proves essential to automatically come up with those intricate trajectory. And, and, and again, one, one big advantage of our approach is this flexibility of the design input. So without changing much from the, from, from, from the compiler solver side, Here's another example that's planned and executed using our approach. In our paper, we provide two more examples of using our, our approach to model other previously proposed more non-standard uh, robot processes. So th really the emphasis here is this flexibility in modeling different kinds of robot processes and our workflow can really act like this bridge that brings the power of those computational tools from the robotics community to the, to the front of designers so that we can focus on where we, where we are trying to advance the, the new construction behaviors and the rest of it is taken over by the algorithm. So in summary in this work, we provide a compiler solver approach to fill this important missing gap between the programming of the high level construction process intention and the low level uh, generation of robot programs. We've shown its effectiveness in planning for this uh, new um, timber processes, and it really provides designer with this, um, with this flexible means to test and deploy new robot capability. And finally, I want to switch away and talk about a different type of planning to switch from planning for the actions of robot builders 
to planning how do we use uh, material re resources. And the main motivation behind this work is really we, we, try, we, we want to limit the usage of new virgin materials in the built environment and, and, and think, really think about how to upcycle materials that's already available for, to us as structural waste, either, in, uh, in, um, either from existing buildings or from the built environment or from the natural world, sorry. Things like tree branches are normally chipped, degraded, and turned into carbon emissions in a year. We can instead salvage and use this in a generative design process to, to design structures with high strength. Where that strength really comes from the, the amazing internal fiber structure of the trees. And how, however, compared to designing in an unconstrained fashion, uh, re design with reused materials requires extra times and efforts and creativity from the designer to work with this constrained kits of parts. Despite the increasing interest in the, in the community on, on this idea of designing with reused parts, we nevertheless do miss the generic computational assignment workflow that can cater irregular geometry, find optimal assignment, and, and while well staying responsive to design changes. So we address those needs by proposing an optimal assignment workflow that consists two key ingredients. The first, we use a geometric regis registration algorithm to, you know, get to compute a shape different di distance between each pair of design geometry and the inventory shape. And then we compile a distance matrix and feed it into a specialized uh, assignment, uh, linear assignment algorithm called the Hungarian algorithm to compute the optimal matching. And uh, what it means to design is that using this workflow, we can now optimize this grid shell. Instead of optimizing for its structural efficiency, we can now optimize for effective re reuse of the tree branches that we have in our inventory. And with, uh, again, with the advances of uh, robotic fabrication, the, fabri the, the, the processing uh, of these, these shapes can, be, can all be simplified and, and the cutting path planning can be automated and the assembly can all be simplified. So we essentially, we're still working with a kit of parts, but this kit of parts is, is really is unique. And they are driven by the natural geometry that we encounter in our, natural, in our natural materials. And this idea can be extended to different type of geometry, for example, reusing linear timber elements from a disassembled house to design greenhouse domes. And our, and our assignment algorithm can give us this best way to assign and cut those salvaged materials to minimize the cut-up waste. And with our tool, designer can have, have this quantified feedback on material utilization and other objectives while exploring different type of design options. And coupled with multi-objective optimization, we can have a more systematic way to really balance those different objectives, for example, the material utilization and the total floor area that we, we, that we achieve with those stones. And we can look at those different design options on this Pareto front. We have also used this technique in our teaching at MIT. We give the students our matching tool and they start to do all those creative things with those traditionally undervalued waste materials. For example, designing a span spanning structure with, with oyster shell pieces or designing a light cover with the broken beer, bo beer bottles or even like these abolished bike frames, they can start to think about ways to reuse it as structural nodes for a spanning truss. So in summary, in this work, we demonstrate the uh, intelligent resource planning algorithm can help us to design in a more responsive way to upcycle material, material resources. And this really help us to design in a more flexible way. And this enables a lot of creativity and, and the use of computation in new ways. So in summary today, I've shown a few design and construction problems and show how planning of those problems can be assisted by algorithms. And in many of those cases, existing computational tools can only help us solve only part of the problem. And we really need to be creative and try to think about ways to, to compose them and use them and, and use them in a more effective way with an integrated framework. And, and, and uh, in this first project, we use this integrated search process to search for both assembly, assembly sequence and robot motion at the same time to allow design flexibility. In the second work, we try to expand this, this success to, to support the modeling and solving and programming of new robot fabrication processes. 
And finally, we show a, a resource planning algorithm can help us to design in a res more systematic way with upcycled material. And this is just a small sample of what automated planning can really do for us to help us improve this connection between design and construction. And in the future work, I, I, I aim to really push for a more integrated plan planning framework that not only just includes a robot, but also for humans and also materials and consider the scheduling and other stuff. And also I'm interested in this idea of a reactive planning that can, that, that can really react to, 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 to a situation when the rea construction reality deviates from the simulation too much. And, they can, and the planner can automatically come up with those short or long-term uh, adjustment to counterbalance those different kind of deviations. And finally, as we all strive to do, we're trying to push the adoption of those techniques in real projects to demonstrate how we can improve things and in the path forward. And uh, it's time to, 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 to do a little self-promotion. Uh, um, I'm on the job market now. So if you, on the faculty job market now, so if you are interested in any of these aspects or just wanna chat, re please feel free to, sh to reach out. And before I end, uh, uh, before I wrap up, I want to mention that none of those work would be possible without great people. So a huge thank you to all of my friends, the, the mentors and colleagues and lab mates, and, uh, and of course, um, the, the funding agency that makes all of this possible. And thank you very much. very much for this wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and now it, we would have time for some questions, which I would like to give to the audience first. Um, do you have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Huang? No questions? <laughs> okay, so I can go ahead uh, because I also have a question myself. <laughs> Um, in your first work, you mentioned that uh, you are assembling these different parts uh, of wooden elements. And I really appreciate that you include a structural analysis uh, in, a, in this assembly, because I, I think it's a really integral part <laughs> when you're um, doing uh, work in this region. Um, now, you mentioned that you do linear elastic analysis. Have you tried out other types of analysis methods or maybe other material elements except for these wooden elements wh which you can maybe analyze with linear mm -hmm. elastics quite well? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think what we're trying to, to really demonstrate here is you know, the consideration of structural constraints, as, as you mm -hmm. said, is very important. Mm -hmm. And this planning framework is supposed to be generic enough that you can just, you know, swap mm -hmm. and plug and play of different type of modules. Mm -hmm. We haven't tried different type of, uh, of you, know, you know, for example, for plate assembly, you definitely will not use frame structures analysis method to do it. Mm -hmm. And for concrete structure is something very different. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to in collaboration with the future colleagues, you know, you can, you can take your analysis method, you know it's, it's accurate, it's fast, and you know, you can swap it in. And voila, the, the entire framework is still working. And, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, amazing talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I really love to see, you know, how much uh, brain is, not, uh, is necessary to make all these projects work. And I think it's very beautiful to, you know, to see that these things are not easy. They're very difficult. <laughs> and uh, they need a lot of different specialists. And I, I therefore, I really love to see a bit of the background stories of these projects. Um, what I was wondering, because I saw with the, with the proc project of Victor that um, after the clamps got released, the structure moved. Yeah. So my question is, do you have like a feedback system that is tracking the actual build structure and feeds that back to the solver to like, or is there a vision on that? Because I, 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 I wonder that you can simulate, but I, I guess this linkage between the digital and physical reality might be something to strive for. So it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing that it includes a lot of our ongoing research. So specifically for that project, everything I do or we do is offline planning. Okay. So we run the planner overnight 
get the player on next morning, and then we can load it onto the robot. And of course, it's not accurate because the robot will move over. Some timber material property is very hard to capture, right? And things will deform, you know, will you know, just deviate for like a few centimeters. And now the, 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 the patch in this project is that Victor used this little camera to capture those deviation and adjust. And in the future, definitely, I, I aim to really do this, this is included in this vision of reactive planning because of course construction is never something that you can plan just one shot. It, it requires a lot of those online adjustment and replanning. So in that project, we do this patch, but in the future, we want to use this plan offline planning as a baseline because we, we, kind of, we can anticipate and use it as a benchmark. And then when things deviate, we replan on the fly. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks for the very rich uh, presentation. I have uh, one question, maybe just follow up the assembly um, project. And I feel like you expand the, uh, let's say, traditional motion plan of a robot and include considering the assembly sequence and the uh, structural um, stuff. Mm. Uh, my my question is, a lot of computational efforts comes from the, the possibility uncertainty. You have to try a lot of um, uh, things. And I, I feel like, uh, um, uh, did you have interest in thinking about uh, uh, maybe add some uh, human intuition to reduce the, the possibilities to improve the computational efficiency? Thanks. Yeah, so that's a very good point. I think what you are hinting at is something that the human is teaching the heuristic. So you're talking about the, the heuristic is takes this job of in the, doing the search, which evaluate which direction is more promising to go. So you are thinking you're you're tell, you're 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 basically uh, advocating for like evolving human to teach those heuristic in some way. And I think it's a very very promising direction because those those heuristic, even though in this project the structural heuristic works well for this assembly process, but for more general construction process it might be very hard to design a generic heuristic that works for everything. So using some human intuition to, for example, teach uh, a, a machine learning model to, for, to have this meta heuristic to guide the search automatically, I think is a very promising direction. Could you please repeat the end of that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying that um, maybe I'm saying highlighting the maybe you in the future using human in some domains to, to teach a machine learning model as a meta heuristic. You know, for some domains it might be very hard to have a, this generic one shot heuristic that works for everything. It might be useful for some extra ex human expert to teach a machine learning model. And this thing can guide the, the planning, the automated planning in some way in a more effective fashion. Thank you. Did that answer the question? Yes. Great. <laughs> um, thanks for your really interesting presentation. And I, I think it's really cool to see how computer science has so many different applications. Um, I had a question. You talked about being 50% architectural engineer, 50% computer scientist. And you asked about um, the structural analysis and the assembly process. What do you think is more computationally demanding? the structural analysis or the assembly analysis. Obviously, your answer might de change depending on how many pieces you have. Um, but obviously, both is quite a complex computer science problem and a problem to program. So just be interested to hear what you think. Short answer is um, motion planning is harder. <laughs> <laughs> because you know we, as, as a as structural engineer, has so many years, decades of development. And now we have very efficient you know, linear solver you know, FEM programs and mathematical framework to support, you know, it's, it, uh, it always boils down into this, something like a, something about linear algebra to make this prediction. And motion planning, you know, think about this problem. Like you're trying to, you're trying to operate this thing from here to here, but there are just so many different things here. And how would the algorithm can decide there's no visible motion from here to here? So in computer science term, it's called decidability of a problem. And deciding whether this uh, a solution exists for the scenario is, I, I don't think it's a really solved problem in, in, in robotics community. 
So this is just a, a difference between these two. And also, you know, underneath the motion planning, there's collision checking, which is, has its own right, is still um, actively being developed. And all of those pieces come together, I think would make motion planning more harder to, in terms of computation. But I mean, I, I, I don't mean to say that structural analysis is easy. You know, a lot of those pieces to make, to account for uncertainty, the material properties to get those things right is also tricky. Thank you also for your nice question. Maybe I will have one more question at least. <laughs> yeah, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I want to ask a question or maybe challenge you. You talked about your, your future and I can't stop looking at this final slide. And I don't see the relevance to sustainability of the picture. No, 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 right, right. And I think, um, You've presented excellent work. I, g I think your next challenge is to look at the questions where you can have an impact at scale, right? And um, if you're going to go interviewing, I wouldn't put a print of that size along a claim of saving the world with your work. And you have done excellent work, but think about the problems, and you have some in your talk, where you can have an impact. The question of the nodes in the trees is very nice. Um, it, it, it brings a lot of challenges. Um, and then the question is, where is the, imp the real impact? How does it compare? And I think there's a lot of exciting things to do on um, highly impactful problems. And um, so my encouragement is to not lose that of sight and avoid a bit sticking sustainability where it doesn't necessarily belong or developing your arguments. But otherwise, congratulations on a nice technical talk. Does anyone have another question? No? OK, then maybe before we end this, uh, seminar series of the spring, I would like to advertise for our speakers, Professor Corentin Thive from EPFL, um, Dr. Rudy Kehlen from Texas, Katrin Dörfler, uh, which you might have seen as well at Daniela's presentation, and from ETH as well in the end, Dr. Christoph Weibel. Um, so stay tuned and attend also the upcoming seminar series. We would be very happy to see you there again. And now this is the end of this seminar series. Thank you again very much for making your way up here to ETH and Quebec. <laughs> and um, please enjoy the apero and have more questions maybe for Dr. Huang. Thank you. Thank you.